Hello, plant people. How are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soul scientist. On this channel, I like to take plant science and apply it to all things plants. And today's video is my solicited, unsolicited advice on Jess from Roots and Refuges soil situation. So this was brought to my attention by several of you guys via Instagram, YouTube, name it, saying I needed to watch Jess's last two videos because she's having a soil issue and they thought I'd be interested in watching it all the way to I'm having something very similar to this. What the heck is going on? And her first video, she kind of just shows the issue um, and how it's represented in the plants. And then her second video, she goes into a bit of a rant about how she's upset with the direction the industry, in particular soil industry, is going. And it's, I mean, completely justified. Gardeners of that scale in particular put a ton of time but money into gardens. So for it to do what it did is incredibly frustrating. Um, and I don't blame her at all for getting upset. But we're going to go over kind of a little bit on ways she can or you can in um, if you're suffering from the same issues root claim it in less than the five years that she's concerned it will take her to potentially turn this around and she's doing a really good thing by not simply just ripping all that soil out and then replacing it with something new so when i initially watched the first rant video she essentially said in there that the soil was damaged um it was contaminated by grazon in particular aminoprylade um, which is a persistent herbicide. It's different than a Roundup glyphosate type thing, which is not a persistent pesticide um, her, or herbicide, sorry. And so she was, she, she believes it's this grax and which it, I mean, very likely could be. We'll talk about what else it could be, but I'm thinking she's probably leaning in, in the correct direction. It's some form of broadleaf desiccant. Um, the only reason I don't necessarily think it's graxin um, in particular is because Grison has like she has cucumbers and stuff that are fine which makes me lean toward it potentially potentially being like a chemical industry surfactant more so that's used for decomposing and helping with water penetration and compost but anyways so with her issue she's not using just soil and this was one of the initial things that I was a little bit confused by because I watched the last video first and she was saying that this was imported soil etc and so forth and so I initially thought to myself well where the heck did she get that soil from because soil naturally even if it is contaminated doesn't hold on to herbicides in that way it's much different and then I began to think well no she's got the cardboard laid down this is probably like a no dig full-blown compost setup, which many of you, if you've been on this channel, know I'm not a huge advocate for. It's okay if you do it. I mean, just plant the garden. I don't care how you do it. It's just not the method that I like. And we're actually running an experiment over on Mind and Soil's YouTube channel where we are going from a no-dig compost garden to a soil garden, um, just to see how it affects some things because his soil tests, which are essentially soilless tests if you're using straight compost you're not working with soil at that point um, we're showing very bizarre values in micronutrients um, macronutrients soil ph organic matters that sort of thing so um, she is for all intents and purposes growing in a soilless medium she's growing in straight compost and she brought this in she imported it in from somewhere in bags. And the company's been made aware of the issue. Um, they've reached out and they're gonna help her reclaim it. I think that the company, from what I heard in the second video, is on the right path, but there are some other things that she tried to give a shot here. So first off, it could be this Grazen or Graxen, whatever, however you wanna pronounce it. Um, it could be the aminoprylade uh, persistent herbicide in that compost, that is the issue. And that wouldn't surprise me because what happens is when aminoprylids or persistent herbicides are sprayed onto a plant material and then that plant material is then composted, it amplifies over time. And I have an interview coming out, fingers crossed next week, where I'm talking to a natural resource management 
a professional from the uh, peat industry. I interviewed him and in it I asked the question, you know, what about the big movement of gardening in straight compost? And he said he always shies away from that. And industries um, involved in food production on a large scale also will shy away from using straight compost. And the reason for that is because there is a potential for amplification of any issues that may be there. And now these may not be as severe as what maybe Jess is seeing, but they can be on a smaller scale um, amplification of say a micronutrient for a plant that is a hyperaccumulator for something like zinc or copper or boron. And when we compost that in the wrong uh, ratios and we plant our plants in it and we plant something that's maybe sensitive to excess boron, we can end up with poor yields that we don't even realize we're having. We'll blame it on the weather or poor watering or whatever the case is. Um, or we can have something really severe where we're seeing this cupping or the shrinking of leaves. And so that's why I always say at least a 50-50 mix if you can. And that's what I prefer and that's what I advocate for people to do as well. Now with that being said, there is potentially another cause for this and it could be chemical surfactants used in the composting process. So when you look this up, it's becoming more and more common actually, oddly enough, where chemicals are being used on compost to help with the decomposition process. And this is because the demand for compost is really, really high right now um, between new gardeners and their setups to the explosion of no dig and the simplification of this, that gardening way of doing things. Surfactants are becoming more and more popular. There's lots of papers written on them. And while there's no real known documented side effects, it wouldn't shock me if there was, for example, Jess is having a lot of problems with the nightshade family, but not having any issues with her cucumbers or her squash or anything of like, like that. So it wouldn't shock me if there's a potential that there's some form of chemical surfactant that made its way into that compost that that company is using that has a negative effect on nightshades but doesn't have an effect on the cucumber plant which would be even more likely in Jess's situation because apparently testing has been sent back to the lab and they're not able to test for any of these herbicides that they're suspecting is causing the issue which if you did not know Typically, when we test any sort of plant biomass, which is essentially what compost is, we're able to get accumulations of high anything. We can, we can tell what's in that. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And always, I've had this happen to me too, by the way, with compost, you need to pre-test. So since that day, about five years ago, um, when I had contaminated compost, I don't know what was in it, it was some sort of persistent herbicide. It took out the nightshade family. All I could grow on it was corn and that I was able to reclaim in about three years. But since then, I've only ever done pre-test using peas or beans, something that grows quick and is a broadleaf. And I will compare a control in straight peat or coconut coir, whatever the case is, soil against the compost grown ones and i want to make sure that my leaves everything is the same size everyone looks the same as long as it passed the pretest, which i've mentioned in other videos then it gets put onto the garden until then it stays off the garden because like i said i've been burned by this before and it will take out an entire bed for minimum of one year if not longer so if you've been on this channel long enough you know that basically any sort of pesticide or herbicide and because i've worked in this industry as well producing these things or not producing testing for the government of Canada to see if they will meet the qualifications to be purchased by humans. One of the things we've talked about is microbial degradation, in particular the soil's degradation over time. So microbes in the soil will eat away at the compounds of pesticides and this is one of the factors that make it legal to apply them because they will degrade. If they don't degrade, they don't pass the smell test by the government basically. So because they're biodegradable, there are ways that we can help the biodegradation process. So for example, we can add more compost that is not contaminated. We can add a wide manure of different composts, such as manures of all different forms, um, mushroom compost, vegetative compost, you name it. So that's one way to help increase the microbial activity. The second way would be through temperature. Now Jess's 
automatically in a very warm climate. Um, so she doesn't have to maybe necessarily do this, but for some of us in a colder climate, this could come in the form of solarization, not cooking of the soil, but just a warming up of the soil through solarization. Um, it can also come in the form of mulching here. Once the soil gets a little bit warmer, we mulch to help insulate the heat, which will allow the degradation process to take um, place longer into the winter month. Um, the next method is going to be increasing soil moisture. So keeping that soil moisture 80 and above at all times is going 80% or above uh, field saturation is going to be the key to really helping the decomposition process. Microbes thrive on moisture. So if we allow things to dry out, every time that happens, we slow down the microbial process. We have to wait for those areas to maybe be recolonized depending on the type of microbe we're dealing with. So just to help with that process and making a very happy, healthy area for it, using mulch and keeping water in that area is going to be key. Now, the next method um, isn't gonna work for Jess necessarily right now, because from my understanding, is she's gonna continue to plant in that area. Um, although I don't think she's gonna get any yields off that plant. So I just personally would rip those plants out and I would till it. And I know this sounds terrifying um, for some people, especially those of you that are doing a no dig situ situation where you have the cardboard down and it looks all good. Um, but the truth is that aeration and air being introduced into that area is going to amplify the microbial process. So if she aerated it just with a pitchfork on the surface level and didn't touch the soil, but just uh, moved the compost in general, that's going to help with air infiltration, oxygen infiltration, which microbes really like and it really gets them going. This is why when we till, we usually see really amplified growth that first year. When we first lay down compost in a no-dig system, we really see rapid growth and it's because of that aeration um, taking place but she can also do a method of aeration combined with dilution. So she could till that compost, remove the cardboard, and then till, or she could leave the comp cardboard in place, I mean, all intents and purposes, and then till that compost layer into the soil layer below. I'm not sure what kind of soil she has underneath that, but all in all, we're going to dilute pretty much in half, depending on the depth we can get that road tiller to, but we can, you know, reduce that by half, use a dilution method with the soil combined with the oxygenation, plus the increased of different microbial capacities from different compost sources. And we're really gonna see some rapid degradation of whatever the heck is in that soil. So I did this personally with the garden that I was having issues with because I don't shy away from till, I don't really care to be honest. Um, and so what I did was I did my compost layer on top. So I actually tilled that in. Now that was in a raised bed at the time. So I did like a um, broad fork method of tilling where I shoved the part broad fork in and I really flipped it. Like I did a total soil turnover and I really diluted it down to about 12 to 16 inches in depth with the soil I had beneath. And I was able to reclaim that soil. Basically by the next year it was fine. Um, so that would be another method that you could give a try out. And that one probably is going to be the most essential and the most effective. So the second method equally as effective to argue. <laughs> um, actually all these would work. If you use these all in combination dress, if you're watching, I would check out you are. Um, I honestly think you could probably turn this whole train around within a year max. I, I, but you'd have stuff growing in there within six months to a year because you are you have a continuous cropping situation where you are too. So you could really turn this around quick. Um, the next one is going to be cover cropping. But with the cover cropping method, you want to go for something with really high biomass. You want to go for something that is a hyper accumulator or a phyto reclaiming version of whatever you choose. Um, in your situation, because you're having issues with broad leaves, I would stick with a monocot variety. So whether this be ryegrass or corn, something of that nature, um, wheat, all these things will work. Sunflowers, while they sound like a good idea, may not grow 
as efficiently or as effectively in that soil. Not saying they won't, but they just may have to struggle a little bit um, because if it is a broadleaf desiccant issue, you don't want to put dicots in or, or broadleaves in. You want to stick with the monocot varieties. And then what you're going to do is literally let that thing grow and you're going to water it and you're going to treat it like it is the most expensive exotic tomato plant you've ever had in your life. You're going to baby it and you want it to grow to excess. Once that is completed, you are going to want to cut down all the biomass. Um, not what you normally would do with a, a cover crop where you would like fold it down and then solarize or kill it in that way. Um, you are going to cut it and then you're going to take all that biomass off your property and burn it, bury it, do whatever you have to, but you don't want to compost or do anything with it. You want to dispose of it. It is now considered reclamation biohazardous waste. You just get rid of it. And you can do this in between cropping seasons, but to be honest right now with your situation, I would clear cut everything and then just start from scratch. And I would start with a, a cover crop with a ton of upper biomass, just really cut it down. And I would talk to a local university and ask them for phytoreclaimers that are particularly predispo um, predisposed to taking up whatever potential nutrient issue or chemical issue you're having. So there's lots of different uh, crops out there and there's lots of different studies that have been made but they'll know combination of your soil type with your zone what variety of plant is best so they will have probably a very specific variety of corn that would work for this application which brings me into my second point about cover cropping is if you could get like a micronutrient profile from the company that did the testing if they're testing for micronutrients there is a slight possibility that it has nothing to do with pesticides it has something to do with an amplification of something that's a hyperaccumulator being composted into that uh, maybe something that has boron um, hyperaccumulation in it for whatever reason it just took a bunch of boron or aluminum whatever the case is and was composted into that which if that is the case then you would just purchase and sow the plant that has a high affinity for boron and then use that as the cover crop and then destroy it obviously in that case but that's only if it's a micronutrient high bioavailability issue over a another issue which i mean your ph or your compost technically if it's you know alkaline or acidic could really you know amplify the bioavailability of something and it's just all all things to think about and the reason i say that is because her pesticide tests are coming back with nothing there's no results on them which is odd to me which makes me think it, there's a potential that it's something else so i think the next point um that i'm going to make she did mention that she's doing this and that is going to be biochar or charcoal preferably biochar so the use of biochar we've talked about before, it has a really high cation exchange capacity. It has the ability to hyperaccumulate different forms of toxins and micronutrients, you name it. So regardless of if it's a pesticide issue or if it's a potential micronutrient amplification issue or something in between like a surfactant issue, it won't matter <laughs> because the biochar is just going to neutralize everything. Now, in an ideal world, you'd have a way of removing the biochar. Um, and I haven't really seen any studies or experiments when it comes to reclamation on removable biochar sources, uh, whether that would be in the form of like a PVC pipe with like holes drilled through it filled with biochar that then would allow water soluble contaminants to then go into the biochar so it can be removed from the cell. Like, I mean, there's many different ways you could try to make a removable um, biochar contaminant because ideally it just would be entirely removed from the soil. So what the biochar will do is it will sequester the toxin or the issue, but it won't remove it. So it's always gonna be there. Um, and then theoretically over time, when the biochar decomposes, it, it could be released, but I mean, I've also been to soil forestry sites where we've dug down and uh, done soil profile digs and there's biochar from a forest fire from 110 years ago. Just to put that into perspective, this stuff just doesn't simply decompose incredibly easily. So, I mean, it's up to you. And the last one is organics, organics, organics. Now, this is just kind of a combination of all of the above um, points. 
from increasing microbial densities, um, diversities, increasing water holding capacity, just dilution of the whole system, taking a poor um, compost and mixing it with a bad, a good compost naturally will dilute the system. So maybe the intensity of the product present won't be as high. Um, and then just overall being able to plant in a zone above a potential other organic stores, along with cation exchange capacity increases, you name it, you name it, you name it. I mean, the list goes on and on. So if you used all these things in combination, you'll be able to come back from contaminated soil or bad soil or poor soil. Um, but keep in mind, you're not growing in soil at this point. You're growing in a soilless medium, essentially, is what's happening. So incorporating it into a soil that naturally is a buffer is really going to help with this, um, just in general. This is why I plant in soil, personally, is what I enjoy. I know how to manage it. There's no curveballs with soil. It just does its thing in my opinion but yeah you can come back from it it's possible I've, I've come back from it but I've had the same thing happen to me as well it's incredibly upsetting so I totally understand the fact that she didn't cry in that video was shocking because when it happened to me I bawled my eyes out because <laughs> it literally took out 24 tomatoes on like and that was like one of my primary beds anyways long story short it's an absolute pain in the butt it's absolutely heartbreaking but it's really quick and easy to turn around. Organic material, diversity in microbes, feed them microbes. Now, if you wanna feed the microbes, I would do like compost teas, algae, fertilizers, molasses, honey, you name it, mix it all in, it's all good. Um, all these things are going to feed the microbes and you'd be shocked at how quickly they can decompose some of this stuff. Aeration is gonna be key. Um, getting a carbon source such as charcoal or biochar in there is going to help immensely along with cover cropping. Actually phytoremediating that soil is going to be huge. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for everyone who reached out asking what the heck to do because you've encountered the same thing. If you're a new gardener, please do the test. <laughs> do the litmus test. I've discussed this on several videos before do the test. It'll save you time and money and frustration, uh, to say the least. And if you have cupping, spindly leaves, anything like that, this is a sign that you're potentially having this issue. Anyways, I want to thank you guys for watching and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.